So welcome to our discussion on Allen Ginsberg's most famous poem, How, which in actuality is the most famous poem of the middle of the American century, the 20th century, and it's also the most influential poem of that period. In fact, many people consider the year 1956 to begin to be the beginning of contemporary American poetry precisely because How was published and changed the poetic landscape in this country. How was written by Allen Ginsberg at a time when the country was locked in a kind of cultural conformity. Everybody was uh, acting in a similar way. I should say most people, the vast majority of people. What had just taken place? It's 1956, 11 years before World War II ended. During World War II, there um, were two primary horrific events which entered the consciousness of Americans as well as uh, the country people around the world, but especially of Americans, and those two events that had such an effect were, first, the use of the atomic bomb. People saw the atomic bomb, uh, um, pictures of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Life magazine. I don't know about Look magazine, but Life magazine, the most famous magazine of the day. Everybody used to subscribe. You could see the mushroom clouds, etc. And then later on, it became clear as reports came back from Germany that the Holocaust had actually taken place. And the effect of this was highlighted again in a magazine like Life magazine, where you saw the skeletal living people who had survived this extraordinarily uh, barbaric event. So these two events, atomic bomb, Holocaust, have a horrific effect on uh, Americans. And the rise of communism following World War II has a similarly uh, fearful effect on Americans. What do they do? Americans tend to turn to work. And while they are turning to work to make things, to get back to life, they also tend to shut off the impulse towards questioning the world around them. The ideal was to have a little house in Pacifica, maybe you know Pacifica in, in, uh, outside San Francisco, or Levittown back east, and you would have this almost prefabricated house with a little white fence around it, and you'd have your 2.2 children, and you'd uh, commute to work and come back to work, and everything would be perfect. Now, I gotta say that there is a lot appealing to that life. But the thing that's unappealing about that life is the fact that associated with it was the notion that you should not question authority at all. This was a democracy where the whole idea is to debate, and yet people did not question any of the uh, overriding values and ideas of the day. Here comes Ginsburg. Ginsburg is one of the members of the Beat Generation, B-E-A-T. And as a member of the Beat Generation, he felt that the culture had beaten down people who were free thinkers, people who wanted to examine the world around them and live in a different way. They didn't have to wear white shirts with dark ties and gray uh, suits. If they were women, they didn't have to they didn't have to stay at home. Staying at home was fine, but they didn't have to stay at home. And yet, if you did not stay at home, if you did not get married, if you did not have children, um, there were all kinds of issues that women faced as well. Ginsburg wasn't especially sensitive about those. But 
the women's, uh, the lives of women kind of was a, a, a big part of this cultural conformity that had taken place. So Hal, therefore, starts in 56, beginning of uh, contemporary poetry. In effect, Hal is a poem that renders old versus new. The old are the forces of conformity. The new are the forces of personal thought. There's a term that we often hear called groupthink. And groupthink means the kind of thinking that takes place when everybody is more or less on the same page and they don't question. Ginsburg was interested in individual expression. This poem puts those two kinds of temperaments at odds with one another. Let me tell you a few other things and then we're going to actually get into the poem and uh, read it. What he called his principal poetic technique was spontaneous bop prosody. Spontaneous bop prosody. Now, we first should start with the word prosody. The word prosody is simply a word which means the rules of poetry. A lot of people think it means prose because it seems to have prose in it, but it doesn't. It just means the rules of poetry. Bop was an improvisational kind of jazz that was being performed at the time. Spontaneous, of course, goes with bop. Improvisational means you make it up in the act of making your music. Spontaneous Bob prosody meant that Ginsburg was making up what he wrote without too much pre-thought. He wasn't figuring out what he wanted to say before he said it. He was trying to write in the act of thinking, write during the very act of thinking. Spontaneous Bob prosody. That's why I think the poem has such a rhythmic flow. It's relentless, actually. We'll get to that, too. There, was, there is another technique in the poem that I really want to draw your attention to. And that is that there is, all throughout the poem, a kind of conflict between earthy, gritty, painful, difficult, physical experience, bodily experience. And then that is countered by a kind of meditative, ascendant, nearly religious, bodyless spirituality. Now I say bodyless, that's the goal, to get bodyless. For Ginsburg and the Beats, some of them felt that we could use the senses of the body and the pleasure of the body to become bodyless and spiritual. Sex wasn't a bad thing for them. But, in the context of 1956, when Hal was written, sex was something we hardly even spoke about in the United States. People were scared even to use the word, that made them nervous to use the word pregnant. Because pregnant meant sex. It was a throwback to a kind of uh, Victorian era. Ginsburg was upset about that kind of closeted thinking, and he wanted to break the bonds of conformist ideas. So why the title How? Because he is howling against cultural conformity. In his great book, Civilization and Its Discontents, Civilization and Its Discontents, Sigmund Freud says that we are always in favor of civilization and simultaneously opposed to civilization. We like civilization because 
It will provide laws and rules, or mores, M-O-R-E-S, mores, that will protect us, that will secure us. On the other hand, we don't like civilization because civilization means we don't get to do what we might always want to do. I could ask all of you, if you drive, do you ever go over the speed limit? If you go over the speed limit, and I'm betting most of you do, you end up being a symbol for that conflict that Freud talks about. You can see this conflict in the poem How. Ginsburg isn't opposed to all of civilization. He is not opposed to laws and certain rules. He isn't a proponent of anarchy. He's not even a libertarian quite. What he wants is openness of thought and tolerance of different behaviors. He is howling, he is ranting against the forces that prevent openness, that prevent tolerance. Let's start the poem. The poem starts with one of the great and most famous lines in 20th century poetry. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. Wow. I mean, it starts out right out of the box. I saw. So we are going to have a poem that witnesses. And what is it going to witness? It is going to witness the effect of forces that prevent us from being who we might want to be. Right out of the box, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. They were starving. They were hysterical. They were naked. Earthy, gritty, difficult, painful bodily experience. And that bodily experience is emotionally difficult. So you get that right from the beginning. And then we go to the next line. Dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night. First three lines. Opening up this description of what's going on here. Do we have any kind of clue yet? or any kind of mention of the opening up of the uh, removal of cultural conformity, his desire to remove us, I think angel-headed, ancient heavenly connection to the stars, what he calls the starry dynamo, maybe it's there. And then after that, the poem becomes a list poem. And almost every line, not every line, but almost every line begins with who. And we're going to see Ginsburg list the different people who did all of these different things, positive and negative, suffering and attempting to break from the chains that held them down. Okay, are there any questions at this point? Shannon. Um. For a spontaneous thought prosody, how is that different than stream of consciousness? Ah, very good question. So the question is, is spontaneous thought prosody different from stream of consciousness? Stream of consciousness is written primarily by fiction writers. It can be written by poets, but primarily by fiction writers, so there's one difference. And stream of consciousness is designed to render the ongoing operations of the mind of a character, showing the associative thought processes. One image or idea triggers another image or idea, and then to that is associated another image or idea, etc. So spontaneous bioprosody has some of that. It is associative. The difference is that stream of consciousness is nowhere near as interested in the musicality. 
And so spontaneous and improvisational, that can seem like stream of consciousness, but uh, the stream of consciousness fiction writer isn't necessarily saying, oh, I'm only going to write you know, whatever comes into my head. He makes it or she makes it seem as if the story itself is inside the mind of this character, and that character is having improvisational thoughts. The writer isn't. For Ginsberg, sp spontaneous Bob Prosody is a rule for writers. The writer is supposed to write and let onto the page what comes into his or her mind. So in Stream of Consciousness, we have probably most famously Joyce, the Irishman, Faulkner, the American, Wolf, the, the Brit. Right? Spontaneous Bob Prosody was a beat uh, poetics. And it was practiced primarily by the Beats. Uh, it influenced others, but no, but uh, the other thing here, I think we should also mention to Shannon and everybody else, the other thing here is that Ginsburg said it was improvisational, he didn't revise, but we have the texts now. We have the, the poem and the original uh, papers of the poem, and he revised the poem. Right. So it, it was spontaneous, but he came back and started revising it, too. Okay. Um, I'm going to go down to line 8. And I want to note the transition from a kind of earthy, experiential sensibility, which I was talking about here, to a more ethereal, metaphysical, even religious sensibility. One of the prime things Ginsburg is trying to do is to yoke these two sensibilities together. He wants physicality to be a good thing, and he wants to have physicality as a kind of gateway to bodiless spiritual experience. The Romantics wanted some of this, some of the Romantics. Let's see what he does here. Who cowered in shaven, excuse me, who cowered in unshaven rooms in underwear, burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the terror through the wall. Who got busted in their pubic beards, returning through Laredo with a belt of marijuana for New York. <coughs> Who ate fire in paint hotels or drank turpentine in Paradise Alley, death or purgatory their torsos night after night with dream, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol and cock and endless balls, incomparable blind streets of shuddering cloud and lightning in the mind, leaping toward poles of Canada and Patterson, illuminating all the motionless world of time between. Okay, so in those lines, we can see the pain of these people, members of the Beat Generation, those who were the best minds of Ginsburg's uh, generation, who hated the conformity, who didn't like to be locked into a way of being, and tried to break from it, and didn't always do it in the most constructive ways. But, like... Baudelaire, who was the French poet in the middle of the 19th century, they felt that if they countered cultural forces, no matter how they did it, they were not only making a statement, but they were helping themselves. That remains to be seen. Then we have, uh, they are unshaven, they're burning money, they're listening to terror, they're, which means... They're probably psychotic. Uh, they eat fire. I'm not sure if they actually eat fire, although there are allusions to people swallowing fire. Uh, they purgatory themselves. Now, one of the things that's so great about this poem isn't simply that he's got these ideas working, but it's in the style. And when he says he 
purgatory their torsos. He's taking a noun, purgatory, and making it into a verb, purgatoried, to purgatory. And he does that to break us out of our normal way of thinking and being, especially as we're reading. So it breaks us out of our way of moving along nice and logically in expected, kind of culturally acceptable ways of thought. And instead, it forces us, it jolts us, it kind of stuns us out of that way of being and asks us to see things and feel things as we read in a new way. Questions? Okay. And so we have this, this pain, and then we have the, uh, the references throughout the poem to materialism, which never provides its promise. The artificial promise of materialism, the promise of materialism, is that if you buy, if you consume, you will become happy by, by virtue of your material goods. E even the very act of purchasing is an act perceived by many to be a kind of pleasure. A kind of ultimate pleasure that leads you to what? To a, 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 a transcendence. You get up and away from your ordinary lives. Go out and buy. It's going to make you feel good. Right? Ginsburg and the Beats, like many others, are suggesting, listen, that is not how to feel good. It's an empty pleasure. You can also see that one of the ways these Beat Generation members acted out was to have sex outside the bounds of the culturally accepted time, the uh, culturally accepted bounds. So in 19, mid 50s, when you have people saying the only time you have sex is in marriage, probably on Saturday night, and, and it's only between a man and a woman. And Ginsburg, who incidentally was gay, was certainly not going to stand for that. Now in his real life, in his actual life, he was a, a very kind man, he was non-materialistic, and he was very funny. Um, but here, at least at this part of the poem, it's not funny. They purgatoried their torsos night after night with dreams, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol and cock, and endless balls. However, there is something else coming in this next line. Incomparable blind streets of shuddering cloud and lightning in the mind, leaping toward poles of Canada and Patterson. Now that's a little bit of a, a kind of a joke. Patterson is uh, a working class town in New Jersey, um, which uh, Ginsburg uh, knew well and uh, which is where William Carlos Williams lived and uh, wrote. Patterson and Canada become symbols, or at least early on the poem, there's a desire to see them as repositories for something more than material well-being, something perhaps metaphysical even illuminating all the motionless world of time between. And there's the line that really breaks out from the rest. Illuminating all the motionless world of time between. Now, speaking of time, we don't have time to go through this entire poem, line by line. I want you to read section one. Um, most people only teach section one. Section two and section three are fine, but they're nowhere near as good as section one. And section one's quite long, as you can see. And I want you to think, when you see these sections that are so painful and difficult, I want you to ask yourself, what is the function of these passages that seem to be designed to shock? Even now, here we are, in the 21st century, it's been so many years, more than 50 years, 
since he wrote the poem. And even now, especially in classrooms, this language can shock us. Why does he want to shock us? I think he wants to shock us to break us out of our usual way of thinking. Even if we dislike what we read, maybe we will come to think about it in a way which is different than the way we thought about it previous. We may even think about something for the first time. We may not have ever thought about these things before, certainly not in this way. So just as he changes his language and he drops commas and he uses nouns as verbs and he runs everything together and the poem has this kind of antic high velocity to it, all of that is designed to change us somehow, get us out of our normal way of being and thinking. So let's see. The poem is characterized by a notion that the consumer mentality is unhealthy. What is healthy? What is good, according to Ginsburg? And he has three religions in this poem that he borrows from primarily. The first religion is Buddhism. All through the poem, there are Buddhist ideas. And I, if, if I could over-reduce Buddhist ideas to one idea, it would be this, that desire is the source of all pain. Desire is the source of all pain. Ginsburg knows that desire for consumer goods, for purchasing, for more and more money, for useless power, all ends up being a dead end, being empty, making us unhappy. Desire is the source of all pain. Now he borrows from two other uh, great religions as well. He borrows from Jewish religion by focusing on what he calls the Bap Kabbalah. And the Kabbalah is a mystical book of Judaism, um, which is, uh, which like some Buddhist methods, um, asks us to think in ways which are not rational. They're not illogical, but they're alogical. And finally, he also borrows from Christianity. Especially interested, he is, in the figure of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, for everything we've been talking about. Jesus Christ is an, an anti-establishment figure. He comes at a time when materialism in its own way, behavior in its own way, was leading people away from spiritual happiness, from enlightenment, and to a kind of baseness. So what we end up with in how is the conflation of Buddhism, the Kabbalah, and Jesus Christ. He brings it all together. So if you look at line 19, Whole intellects, disgorged in total recall for seven days and nights with brilliant eyes, meet for the synagogue cast on the pavement, who vanished into nowhere Zen, New Jersey, leaving a trail of ambiguous picture postcards of Atlantic City Hall, suffering eastern sweats and Tangerian bone grindings and migraines of China under junk withdrawal in Newark's bleak furnished room. What you have there again are the best minds of the generation, trying to break free, doing it in ways that might not be the best, and trying to ascend towards some kind of spiritual betterment. The synagogue is mentioned. Zen is mentioned. Eastern sweats is mentioned. Eastern religion. Who wandered around and around at midnight in the railroad yard, 
wondering where to go and went, leaving no broken hearts, who lit cigarettes in boxcars, 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 racketing through snow toward lonesome farms in Grandfather Night, who studied Plotinus, Poe, St. John of the Cross, telepathy, and Bop Kabbalah, because the cosmos instinctively vibrated at their feet in Kansas. So the Beat Generation traveled, and if uh, you know about Jack Kerouac, you know about the great book called On the Road, and uh, so you know they drove all over the country. Movement, the act of movement, motion itself, was one of their methods. They felt that if they could move, that in the act of motion, they might be able to gain enlightenment themselves. And here, look what we have. Plotinus, Poe, St. John of the Croft, uh, Telepathy, Bat Kabbalah, the whole thing. The poem is punctuated throughout by terms that render Ginsburg and the Beat Generation's desire for something that is ascendant, that is divine. It is, in its own way, looking for the kind of intuitive, romantic vision that existed in 19th century England and 19th century America in those poets. Poets like Wordsworth in England and Whitman in the U.S. The trouble is, those poets believed by studying nature and communing with nature, they could read the signature of God in the natural world and find enlightenment and that ascendance, even though they were here in their own bodies. Ginsburg wants that, but he has a countering force to deal with, which I've talked about all through the class. That is the force that says, do exactly this and nothing else. Do not question. Do this and nothing else. And Americans, again, fearful after World War II, kind of march to one drummer. Um, now, we're starting to head towards the end of our discussion. And we could talk a lot about many of the different references throughout the poem. And I know that they're all not easy to understand. And the, word, the further we move from 1956, the more difficult they might be for you to understand. But I think it's a good thing, it would be a good thing for us, to look towards the end of the poem and to see how Ginsburg tries to wrap this, all, this whole thing up. So why don't we look at line 68, and I'll, I'll read this whole ending and then briefly make some comments on what he's doing here. Who in numerous protest overturned only one symbolic ping pong table, resting briefly in catatonia, returning years later, truly bald, except for a wig of blood and tears and fingers, to the visible madman doom of the wards of the mad towns of the east. Pilgrim states, Rocklands and Greystones, fetid halls, bickering with the echoes of the soul, rocking and rolling in the midnight solitude bench dolmen realms of love. Dream of life, a nightmare. Bodies turned to stone as heavy as the moon. And mother, finally, and the last fantastic book flung out of the tenement window, and the last door closed at 4 a.m., and the last telephone slammed at the wall in reply, and the last furnished room emptied down to the last piece of mental furniture, a yellow paper rose twisted on a wire hanger in the closet, and even that imaginary, nothing but a hopeful little bit of hallucination. Ah, Carl, while you are not safe, I am not safe, and now you're really in the total animal soup of time. And who therefore ran through the icy streets 
obsessed with a sudden flash of the alchemy of the use of the ellipse, the catalog, the meter, and the vibrating plane, who dreamt and made incarnate gaps in time and space through images juxtaposed and trapped. The archangel of the soul, between two visual images, and join the elemental verbs and set the noun and dash of consciousness together, jumping with sensation of pater omnipotens i eterna deus, to recreate the syntax and measure of poor human prose and stand before you speechless and intelligent and shaking with shame, rejected, yet confessing out the soul to conform to the rhythm of thought in his naked and endless head. The madman bum, an angel, beat in time, unknown, yet putting down here what might be left to say in time come after death, and rose reincarnate in the ghostly clothes of jazz, in the gold horn shadow of the band, and blew the suffering of America's naked mind for love into an Eli, Eli, Lama, Lama, Sabak, Fanny saxophone cry that shivered the cities down to the last radio with the absolute heart of the poem of life butchered out of their own bodies, good to eat a thousand years. What a remarkable ending. Feel the velocity of this poem moving. So he's referring in this poem, the poem's dedicated to his friend Carl Solomon, who was in fact institutionalized. He was one of the best men of the minds of the generation destroyed by madness. And he actually addresses Carl Solomon here at the end of the poem. Notice that we begin that section, uh, returning years later, truly bald except for a wig of blood. Who had the wig of blood? Jesus Christ had the wig of blood. It could have been a reference to the crown of thorns, the blood coming down. And the poem at the end does what it's been doing all along. It's been objecting to a kind of consumeristic, Madison Avenue driven idea that conformity and materialism will make you happy. In fact, it's also saying that will not make you happy. It has made others suffer. You will suffer. And so we get down to the end of the poem. And who becomes the hero? The sensation of pater omnipotens i eterna deus. All powerful father, eternal God. Ginsburg asking us to become spiritual. And then we get down to the last two lines of this section one of the poem, this great section one. And the madman bum, that's the generation of the beats. Who are they? They are those who rise in the ghostly clothes of jazz. And I think the word rise is key there. And we've been talking about Bob Prosody. They rise in the ghostly clothes of jazz, in the gold horn shadow of the band, a jazz band. And blue, in other words, like a saxophone, blue, the suffering of America's naked mind for love, trying to strip America's uh, attitude away. Because down deep he's saying we all want this other kind of love of, of self, love of other person, other people, and love of God. And what happens? We blow the suffering of America's naked mind for love into an Eli, Eli, Lama, Lama, Sabbath, Fanny, saxophone cry. Eli, Eli, Lama, Lama, Sabbath, Fanny, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words Christ speak on the cross. Ginsburg saying, Christ knew, the Kabbalah is a path, Buddhism is a path. Why did you forsake spiritual values? The absolute heart of the poem of life, butchered out of their own bodies. Whose bodies? 
the bodies of the beat generation, good to eat a thousand years, who knows how to read that ending? I like to think the ending means that even though the beat generation has suffered so much, those people have suffered so much, those people who wanted to be different have suffered so much, that they were plugged in, even if errantly, they were plugged into something that was a path to the truth, to betterment, to enlightenment. And so their lives are good to eat. They are nourishment for us. So let me finish with this. Ginsburg critiques American materialism and he advocates a kind of free-thinking spirituality. He uses this kind of rhythmic, high-velocity expression, which makes us kind of get on board the wave. We kind of ride this mesmerizing wave. And he vacillates back and forth between these kind of graphic, gritty depictions of individual human physical suffering on one hand and spiritual metaphysic, metaphysical ascendance on the other. He can never get us up and ascending upon, uh, away from the forces. He sees Christ as the archetypal anti-establishment hero. He sees the Kabbalah as a path, Buddhism as a path. He uses unusually graphic off-color language in order to critique the puritanical uh, mores of the time and to shock us out of how we think. He asserts that the dream of a life in which the human body is a host of pleasures can be a good thing if we can use those pleasures to move into something spiritual. Previous to Ginsburg, D.H. Lawrence had been doing the same thing earlier in the century in his fiction in England. It is, it is a, a political rant, it's a howl, it's a chant. And uh, in all three religions, Buddhism, Judaism, Catholicism, there, is, there can be chanting ceremonies where we get hypnotized almost and ascend mentally and emotionally into a state of mind that is congruent, we hope, with that of the Lord, with that of divinity. But the poem has a kind of tension, a deliberate tension, on one hand, it has an impulse towards that mesmeric state that mimics or even leads us to an enlightenment or an enlightened perspective. And on the other hand, that is impossible because of the countering assertion in the poem that our market culture, our consumeristic culture, our puritanical culture, our fearful culture, undermines the human desire for that kind of enlightened perspective. Any questions? Could the name beat also refer to the rhythm and the influence of like jazz the, and the beat generation, is that yeah. what you mean? Everybody asks that. And everybody kind of thought, does the beat generation come from the rhythm or beat of jazz music? Mm -hmm. And the beats always said no. They said it comes from the notion of being beaten down. And they were beaten down by uh, all these kind of mores. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.